Uh, on behalf of um, Fritu and the Norwegian Journal of Photography, um, I wish you to welcome you all to this seminar. Um, we are proud, proud to present two well-known and acclaimed photographers here tonight. Uh, first, you're going to meet uh, the Magnum photographer, Olivia Arthur. She has worked as a photographer since 2003. Uh, and spent several years of her career outside the UK, where she's from. And today she will show pictures, of course, and, and also talk about uh, uh, the importance uh, she places on integrating words uh, with images into her books. After Olivia and some uh, questions, maybe, uh, we head on to Eugene Richards, who's back in Norway, Two years since last time? One? One year, yeah. <laughs> and um, he has, I think, at least produ uh, produced <laughs> at least 17 books, maybe more since I checked last time. <laughs> and um, he's always focused on personal projects. And uh, in front of us, I think he will present not only his pictures, but also uh, introduce us to um, short films that is both shot and uh, directed. But first up on the stage is uh, Olivia. The stage is yours. Welcome. Okay, I'm going to um, uh, also uh, show uh, some brief video. Um, so I wanted to start off, um, people are often curious to see as photographers how we work and um, uh, I will stand here and show my pictures and talk to you about them. But uh, first I'll very briefly show you something from a project that I did um, uh, just over a year and a half ago now in Crimea. Um, so this was just after um, the Russian annexation of Crimea. Um, I was sent there to make a project. It's, it's, so this is, it's, I showed this to you because it, it shows me at work. Um, when I make my personal work, it's a very slow process. It takes a very long time. Um, and I don't have any more filming me, so I don't have anything to show you from that. So this is a project that I did. It was over the course of nine or ten days, I think. Um, but I had necessity of filming. And we were given a certain amount of freedom to make work in our own way. And uh, the, so the main difference between the time and constraint. So uh, I'll just show you this brief. My project is called Crimean Diaries, and the idea um, was to find three different characters um, and to try and see Crimea from their perspective. One Ukrainian, one Russian, and one Tatar. The, the main idea was to try and show the place through their eyes. But I wanted to do something that went, in a way, further back. So it's not just about because this this kind of period of the conflict there was very brief, and you know they had they had this uh, referendum, and um, and actually what I was more interested in was the kind of feeling of identity. So I had ten days, um, and the idea was to spend um, three days with each character. It actually became very difficult to find someone Ukrainian. People wanted to join Russia. I mean, that's very clear. I think from everybody from outside, even if you disagree with how it was done, is that most, on, you know, for the most part, people wanted to be part of Russia. Having looking for people from these different backgrounds was the idea of looking at. What they like, how they feel about themselves, what do they associate themselves with as a country? Because, for from an outside point of view, this idea of like switching a place between different countries just seemed very strange. There were a lot of people that we got in contact with who were were pro-Ukrainian or um, who we'd heard of and who had left or who didn't want to talk. Um, or, you know, things became complicated. And that, that was why I found it interesting to make this search, to try and understand, like, I think that's where, you know, it becomes a little bit more political, to try and understand, like, why people, A, didn't want to talk, or, or didn't exist, or, you know, why was there nobody there if they were left? 
Um, so that was interesting. Everybody that I spent time with on this project talked about was the kind of propaganda that was put out in the media on both sides, both in the West and in Russia. It's not a conflict zone, it's not a, but we have this misconception that that's what's going on there because of what's going on in the rest of Ukraine. Um, and what people say in, in Crimea is like, well, you know, we're thankful that we don't have a war going on here because we did this thing. So now I'm actually um, going to go, so as I say that was about a year and a half ago, I'm actually going to go um, uh, right back and show you something, um, well, or, or rather just mention um, uh, India. So I, I, in 2003, I started my career as a professional photographer, um, and I did that in India. I, um, I had the opportunity to move there and live there for a couple of years, and... Um, uh, I think, although I'm not really going to show you a lot of pictures from India, it's, it's very important for me to talk about it because I feel it's where I learned to be a photographer. Um, and that everything that I've done since then is sort of derived from that in, in, in the sense of that's, what I, that's where I learned to, to look at the world in a certain way and it's where I found my subjects. And, and, and one thing moves on to another and, and when I... When I uh, stand here now. In fact, when I look at my, my body of work, I've done made two bo two books about the Middle East. So I never set out to go and make books about the Middle East, but it, it in a way it all began it all began in India. So I um, so I had this opportunity to go and, and, and live there, and I started um, I lived in Delhi, and I started working for newspapers, working on little stories, um, traveling around the country, and I I um, it's I learned to I I, I, I learned to kind of follow a story to find something interesting. It was a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, I, I, I had, I, it's such a rich place. It's so full of different, um, different things. Everywhere I turned, there was a, there was a new interesting story. And I, I think um, I had, you know, I'd grown up essentially in, in, in the UK and in London. And, and had I started out as a photographer there, I think I would have done things very differently. And I would have probably ended up um, having to do certain things to make a living um, that I, would had a lot more freedom with living in India in that period. So um, I, I continue to go back there often. I'm still working on a, on a large book project there, and, and um, in fact, I've just been um, commissioned to go and make a body of work um, in collaboration with an Indian photographer, which is something that's quite that's quite exciting for me. Something something new. Um, but um, but one of the things that happened while I was travelling across India and working on all these different stories. Mainly, I mean, very journalistic. You know, I came to it very much from a journalistic point of view. I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to get my pictures in newspapers. So that's that's really how I came to photography. I I, um, I studied maths originally um, at university, and I worked for a student newspaper, and, and that was what that was what drew me the the, the stories and, and getting the pictures in print and telling stories with the pictures and and um, um, and I was doing and I I hadn't really set out to do something. You know, I didn't have an agenda. I didn't say I want to do. You know, I want to make this, you know, talk about this issue, or I wanted to I look for the particular individual stories, and I remember before I went to India, um, uh, an older photographer saying to me, you know, you, you must make stories about women, um, and, and I kind of brushed it off, and I thought, that's not, that's not what I wanted to do, it was I just wanted to go and, you know, see what I found, and, and follow the different stories, um, but I lived there for two and a half years, and it, it's something that kind of crept up on me. I never really thought about it, but the more I was covering other stories, the more there were these stories of women in, you know, within 
what I was working on that kind of the, the, they were the things that were really that were really getting me that were sticking with me that were um, staying in my mind afterwards and that I wanted to talk about more and, and, and this sort of built up over time that I lived there um, and I began to want to address it in some way um, and I had never worked on a on a, a large body of work in, in that sense I, I was you know I was jumping on a train and going to tell a little story to get in a magazine or, or going I, I started working on I suppose the first thing that I started doing then was working on a little story in Kashmir about the women whose um, husbands had disappeared in the conflict, and that was maybe a sort of starting point for me on this. And so um, I had been living, I had been living there for just over two years um, when I was invited to go to a place in Italy called uh, Fabrica, and it was, it was very sudden. They kind of said, "Okay, you can come here, you can come for a year. Um, we sort of." fund your work and you, it was very unclear exactly what it was but it, it sounded like a good opportunity and but you have to come like next month um, and so all of a sudden I left and it was it was a strange thing for me and as I say I, I keep working in India and, and I think in large part because I left so suddenly um, I hadn't finished I hadn't you know I hadn't I hadn't kind of figured out all the things that I wanted to figure out um, but I, um, so I was invited to, to Italy, to, um, to this place, and, and we were all invited to start working on a larger body of work that was going to be part of an exhibition, and, um, and I came forward and I said I wanted to do, this, do a project about women. Um, and there is something that I had been, and this is something, even while I was in India, I had been thinking about this, and I had been thinking about trying to address this issue and how to, how to talk about some of, some of the issues, the way it, it was... You know, it was a lot about the way women were treated within their families, the way the, the sort of position they had in society, um, and trying to talk about that, but also not trying to. I didn't want to just say, okay, I've seen this and I think it's bad, I, and, and, I, and I also found that, for example, going into uh, very poor villages in India, for example, and trying to. Um, explain the stories that I found there to an audience that my audience at that time was, you know, and, and I, I guess is really still very much um, uh, Western, European, British. Um, you know, I was working for newspapers, uh, magazines that were mainly getting published in, in the UK. And, um, um, I, I was aware about that, and I wanted to find a way to kind of bridge this, this gap between what I was photographing and, and who I was showing it to or where I, where I came from. Um, in, in a sense, and um, so I had this idea that um, I would look for an in between, like a place where those two things kind of crossed over. Um, and and the, the idea was to go to the border between Europe and Asia, and to follow that borderline. And with this with this in mind, to kind of look for this place where one thing would meet the other. Um, and I say that now in, in the knowledge that it's quite naive, and I think even in the time that even at the time I know that that is naive. I knew that it was naive, but it was a starting point. And I know that, of course, when you go to the border between Europe and Asia, which runs through, you know, Turkey and the Caucasus and Russia, what you find is not India mixed with the UK or anything like that. It's, it has, it's a, you know, these are their own countries with their own different influences and, and um, uh, sets of issues. Um, but it was my starting point. So I took this geographical border as a place to kind of go and explore. Um, and this is the first picture that I took on that. Um, on that project, so I took um, my um, director there said it's, this is all about a journey from Europe to Asia, so you have to take a boat. So I took a boat from Italy to Turkey, which took three days, three days of um, contemplation, and then finally we saw something, <laughs> some lights. <laughs> that was the first picture I took on this project. And um, I'll, I'll go through these. Uh, uh, you know, there's, I, have, I have a lot of pictures from this project. There's a lot of different stories and. As I say, I was, I was still very much, very, still was, I still am very much interested in the stories. I was very, I, I've, I've not put this work together in a book, and I, I, I don't know if I will someday, but it was always very important to me to, to, to bring the stories together with the pictures, and, and um, I went into many different situations, but I always wanted to write down, you know, to, to, to spend time with the, with the women that I met, to hear what they had to say, and to, you know, tell their stories, and this is a girl um, saying goodbye to her family on her wedding day. And uh, at her wedding ceremony, at her wedding dinner. And um, this, for example, is a, a the family. So I, went, I traveled down to the east of Turkey. Um, this is a, the house of a polygamous family uh, with the two wives' um, bedrooms. 
And this is um, this is Apple Turk, and it's an internet cafe. Um, and the signs read, uh, um, no politics and strictly no porn. <laughs> <laughs> and um, again, down in the east of Turkey. So I went and, and I travelled. So in fact, in the picture here is, is a, a girl who travelled down with me from um, Istanbul. And, and she's Iranian, actually. But she was kind of, she liked the, the idea of the, um, the adventure. And um, um, I mean, people are often curious, like, how do you meet you know, the people that you photograph? So for example, here... Um, she, she worked in the cafe in, in Istanbul, and, and one of the waiters in the cafe said, oh yeah, you know, my, my family lives down in the east, you can go and visit my family. And so we went and we stayed with his family for, for, uh, uh, sort of, you know, for, for a few days, and we, we spent time. He had three, three young sisters, and I mean, they, they came from a very, very conservative part of East Turkey, where, and the girls were really not allowed to leave the house at all. They had this sort of area here in this little compound outside. And um, they lived in a very, very kind of closed, sheltered environment but they had this wonderful energy and they would you know do the housework dance put on music have fun and I and, and this was one of the first stories I did on this project and it kind of really struck me this energy this the sort of way that they 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 enjoyed themselves they had they found their, their way to have fun and this is one of the sisters the third sister in fact who um uh just started going to school so this is in her in her school uniform she is and in the same class as her six-year-old brother it was kind of her opportunity to leave, leave the house and get out and, and have more contact with the outside world. And so I continued travelling so from Istanbul down through the east of Turkey and then through the Caucasus, through um, Azerbaijan and, and Georgia. Um, and in fact, when I showed the pictures, I mean, I started with some of these pictures from Turkey, but normally when I show the pictures, it's it sort of, I don't necessarily mean it to be chronological. And there's a, there's a sense of, of chronology, obviously, when I put them together, you, you start with something from, you know, the pictures from Turkey go together. But I also like to, to mix the pictures up because I think what's, um, I think what's as important as looking at how things are similar, it's also the, difference, the differences and the similarities between the different places. And I found um, that the people um, in the women that I met, you know, the people in the pictures, they, they also found it really interesting. And I... I um I came back after um uh, went back to Italy after about two and a half months on the road and processed some film because I was shooting everything on film. So I had um so I had this massive bag and they, they sent us out you know just just literally a bag full of film and, and that was the only place to get it processed. And we, you know we couldn't see anything as we were going. So eventually I said okay I have to come back I have to see something I have to know what I'm doing so if this makes any sense. So I went back and I um and, and it was kind of funny because they they lost my luggage actually at the airport and so I literally turned up with just my camera bag and this sack full of film. It, it felt very like okay let's see if this let's see if this this any of this makes any sense. So I I, I processed it and I made I, I sort of printed out some pictures and I, I made a little sort of booklet of you know very something very simple some laser printed um, pictures that have stuck together and 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 I took that back with me when I went back on my journey and and showed it to people and and. And, and I found it was really interesting. I mean, of course, in a very obvious way, it opened doors in that sense that people would um, they get it, they could see what I was doing, and and, and it made made more sense to them. You know, okay, yes, we want to be, you know, we have to be part of this, this you know, book or whatever it is that you're working on. But I also found it really interesting because people would look at um, the pictures and they would find they would find it, you know, interesting to make the comparisons between them and you know, oh wow, look, that's what how women are, particularly. For example, in the Caucasus, between between the different countries, they were very curious to see, you know, how, you know, what is life like actually there. And um, later, in fact, I, I, you know, I went on and I went to Iran. I, I found, I, you know, I travelled up this borderline, and I, I later, in fact, a year later, I went to Iran and I took the same little book with me and, and um, showed it to people. And um, and and the response there was also very interesting. From you know, they're looking, for example, at the, the women in in Turkey and kind of. Dismissing them as oh, you know they're so conservative over there and, and you know we we you know we have much more freedom here and and, and I was just all, it, for me it was always very interesting to see how they would respond to to uh, the different situations and this is in Istanbul well, again this is a girl getting a tattoo of her husband's name on her wedding day <laughs> her husband also got a tattoo of, of her name and in, in Georgia in the metro. And this is in Tehran. And this is right up in, in Ural Mountains. This is Ural Fashion Week. 
Mm -hmm. So it sort of carried on up to to the border. It, it goes through the Caucasus and then up through. It actually cuts through um, Kazakhstan, and I've never been through Kazakhstan, but um, and then goes on up the Ural Mountains in, in Russia, and I spent a bit of time up there. Again, going back a little bit later. Um, this is in the prison in, in Tbilisi. And this one as well. So the wishing tree. So uh, the thing for me uh, with this project was that it was really kind of... Um, it was exploring. I was exploring this issue. I was exploring this this geography, going to places that I'd never been before, and also exploring my way of taking pictures and, and, and putting them together and bringing a lot of different uh, a lot of different stories, a lot of different things together. And, and um, it's a, yeah, it's a large body of work. It's something that I haven't um, put together yet, um, but I hope someday I will. Um, when I look at the map now, actually, I've been to I've been through Turkey, I've been through um, Georgia and Azerbaijan, Iran, and up to Russia, and now I have this hole in the middle, which is Armenia. So I wonder that maybe I have to go back to Armenia before I call the project finished, but we'll see. Um, I, I found myself with a lot of weddings. You know, I was I, I was I was focusing on young women. I wanted to. Um, I, for, for you know, for two reasons, of, of course, because I, it, there's an interest in this period in life when you make decisions between uh, many different things in terms of work and marriage and and, and education and and you know in these communities that became very important and um, uh, also to look at women who who were of a similar age to me. But as a result, I found myself at a lot of weddings and, and at some point I had this uh, uh, you know card that I printed for myself with you know like a wedding photographer. <laughs> Even though I've never been a wedding photographer. <laughs> 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 um, this is up in, in Russia. This is a 13 year old girl with her baby. And in Iran. In, in Tbilisi. In Brussels. And in the prison in Georgia again. And this is by the Caspian Sea in um, in Iran. I went with a, gr a group of us and we stayed in this this house. And this, I mean, this picture I, I think for me is, is always it sort of represents this this crossover that I I found myself in often um, between. Photographing people and being being the photographer, being the outsider, but also being the friend. And actually, if you look here, you have see my light meter sort of sitting on the table because we were all there together. We were just staying in the house and, and hanging out together. So it's kind of that sense of this sort of dual role, um, something which I found again very much when I was working in Saudi Arabia. And um, on this journey, this I have many kilometres I travelled all the way up this uh, borderline. I drank very very many cups of tea. And this is uh, this is in Iran by the Caspian Sea as well. There's actually a thunderstorm going on in the background with like a, a fork lightning, uh, which I was really hoping I had caught in this picture, but I hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this girl Songul that I met again in, in, in the east of Turkey in that very conservative area, and, and, and she was like, she was someone who didn't care. She said, okay, I don't care what people say. I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll wear my headscarf. I'll do, you know, be respectful, but I also. I got this an area where people, you know, women were hardly out in the streets here at all, and, and, and we went down and they were, you could shoot balloons in the lake, so went to shoot balloons. And, um, and here in her, her little handbag, you see, basically the entire handbag is full up with a big um, uh, dictionary, because that was our only way of communicating, so we had this uh, back and forth. I, and I stayed a couple of days with her family, and we had this back and forth with the dictionary. But she was, she was great, someone with a great spirit. And in, in Tehran, the girl saying her midday prayers. And uh, on, on the wall is a picture of her uncle, who's a wedding DJ. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of rambling through all those different countries, I say. It's all, I mean, it's, it's still very mixed up, but I also kind of like it being that way. I like to jump between the different countries. And um, in a way, that's how I remember it. It's not, I don't divide it up so much.
But um, you know, one thing one thing leads to another. As I say, I ended up making two books about the Middle East, and, and the first one um, in Saudi Arabia. So um, I, you know, I, I had spent this. Uh, you know, I initially went and did this project for Fabrica. They sent me, I went and did it. It must have been three and a half months or something like that on the road. But I went back and then I went to Iran, as I mentioned, and I went to um, Russia. And, and it, you know, it was several years of, of working on this. Um, and as a result of having made this work, I was um, invited to teach a workshop in Saudi Arabia for young women photographers. And I was, I was very curious. So this was in 2009. And I remember, I remember being on a plane going over there and thinking, I wonder, you know, if I'm going to be able to do anything at all. I tried to research a little bit to find out some, you know, to see some pictures of what, you know, what was life really like in Saudi Arabia. I found it incredibly difficult to get any sense of what it was like. And I wrote a couple of photographers I knew who'd been there, um, and who, who, one of whom wrote back to me and said, um, uh, why don't you wear a burqa and use a spy camera? Um, and the other one told me that he um, basically, you know, he, he had to have a government. He got arrested, and then he had to have a government miser with him all the time. And so I didn't go over there with a lot of hopes, and I thought, let's just let's just see. Um, and I, I, as I say, I went to teach a workshop. I did, and I wasn't rushing into taking pictures. I went to I waited to see how it happened. And um, this picture I showed first because I think this this sort of. For me, like capture so much of Saudi Arabia. It's this pristine, like sparkling pool, surrounded by these incredible, like impossibly high walls. You know, everything like kept inside. So this was, I mean, actually my first impression of Saudi Arabia was being on the other side of those walls. So you see all these, you know, big, wide, open roads, and you see these very tall, tall. Um, it looks, you know, peculiar from the outside. So you can imagine you have these sort of compounds and these very high walls just to make sure the neighbours can't see in. Um, so it's a very, it's a very strange feeling place from the from the outside, from the road, um, as it's, you know, as a photographer you always try and walk, you always try and like go and explore a place on foot, but it's really a place that you can't do that, you have to have a car, it's huge, and everybody drives, um, but so I was, yeah, on the other side of those walls. But, um, but as I was, you know, I was teaching a workshop for, for, for these women, a group of, I think, about ten women, and... It was a different. I, I had taught a, a couple of workshops before. Um, you know, I was, I was still quite new to it, but I was, you know, I had had some experience with it. But this was, you know, something else altogether. And their level of uh, was, you know, of what they of what they're able to do. You know, the kind of the restrictions on them and their what their families would let them do. I I wasn't totally aware of it. You know, I was saying, well, you know, one girl she came and she was she was doing these pictures of her cousin and they were. You know, they were, they were great. They, they looked really fun to me, and I sort of encouraged her to do it. And then um, uh, a couple of days later, she didn't turn up, and I was asking what was going on. And um, it turned out that her aunt had found these pictures of her cousin, and in fact, she'd been banned from the workshop, and, and she had a laptop confiscated, and she wasn't allowed to come. She was, um, which was obviously very upsetting. I mean, I didn't. It was. It was. There was a lot of. There were a lot of things to navigate in that way that you didn't, you know, necessarily understand um, initially. Um, she and I actually ended up becoming quite good friends, and she's in some of the pictures, and I spent a lot more time with her family in the end. So it wasn't so much that they didn't, they weren't necessarily against the idea of the photography or, or, or um, you know, of her, you know, doing the photography, but it just people need time to get used to things. So I, she still takes pictures, and I'm sure, you know, her aunt is probably fine with it now, but it, 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 was, it was a shock initially. She's taking pictures of her cousin, it's not okay. And so there were a lot of things to navigate, and um, and I also struggled a lot with you know that they you know so they could make pictures for example so she could have made those pictures of her cousin but not shown them to anyone except for women and they have this concept there which is which is incredibly complicated and, and you know so they I would ask people if I could take their picture and they'd be like who's it for so they would give me permission to take pictures if I was going to just show it keep it for myself or only show it to women which is Sort of an incredible concept, you know. This, this, and you know, they have wedding albums, um, you know, full of pictures. Because the weddings are separate, so you have separate weddings for the men and women. So they have a wedding album full of all the like pictures of the women's weddings, um, but it's only for women to look at. And you have this sort of this idea that you can actually divide <coughs> pictures between. It's, it's incredible, really. And 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 they'll have hard drives full of all the pictures that they've done. I mean, they show me pictures that they, they you know, they dress each other up and like do all these sort of model shoots and. And then they have a hard drive that they only connect to their computer when their computer's not connected to the internet because 
they're worried that people can come, you know, get online and, and see these pictures. So this sort of idea of what you, you know, the limits of it is very confusing. Um, so anyway, I um, um, I, it was it was a long workshop. We spent uh, yeah, it was a couple of weeks in fact. So I was, you know, it was mainly for the first part, just you know, shooting and I mean, the uh, teaching and and uh, just seeing the place and and. and Figuring out if I was going to be able to do anything. I tried taking pictures outside a couple of times, and, and, and you know, get shouts that people would shout at you in the street. And um, uh, photographing in public used to be illegal until um, relatively recently, and a lot of people still think it is. So they'll come up to you in the street and sort of shout at you and say, "No, it's not allowed." Even if you're taking pictures of like the street, the building, you know, nothing. But but there's this kind of very very um, difficult relationship with photography. Um, and I stayed um, one night in this place, this um, women's hostel, which was um, like an apartment building just for women who, who are kind of in the, in the city to work or study but don't have family there. So they have, um, and it's, I mean, kind of, a, kind of an interesting place, like, like a, an apartment building turned into a great big dormitory, essentially. And I, and I stayed there, and, and the, the women there were great fun. We had, you know, we had a really nice evening, we had dinner, and, and um, I talked to them about my work and, and my photography and they said you know you know we'd love to help you um but you know you couldn't take any pictures of us unless we were wearing our abayas um at which point i said well why not so this is kind of uh, at about one in the morning they all put on their abayas and their niqabs and everything and they're sort of making a, a, a pretend coffee pot because these are coffee cups the arabic coffee so they sort of make this and they and and we started doing these you know, taking these pictures, and, and they found it very funny. It was it was kind of it was kind of a joke, and then we sort of posed and did all these things, and and, um, and and you know, to me, I can see that they're kind of laughing under that. But <laughs> I had this this you know, at some point, someone saw these pictures, and, and someone said to me, but but do they wear that in bed? And um, <laughs> so then I realised, you know, okay, this I have to. This, they, nobody's getting the humour, and I have to find a, a better way to try and explain. Um, you know what it, what life is actually like. So I, I mean, I, I still I like these pictures a lot because to me this was they, they thought it was very funny as well. And then at the end they thought they, they said to me that was that was a lot of fun. We never thought of doing that. So thanks. It was, it was sort of strange. It was a strange strange thing to do. And I but I also realised I had to move on from that. Um, and I had to find a way of photographing and trying to show a little bit of reality that people couldn't imagine that that you know that that wasn't actually the reality. Um, and so I had to look for other ways to kind of conceal faces, to be to be careful, to be respectful. And so I have a whole lot of pictures like this, you'll see that you can't quite see the faces. And and I spent time with them. And have, these are sort of so these are this is in someone's house in their sort of living room. <laughs> um, they have incredible um, spaces. Um, and. Uh, and I would also um, get invited to parties, um, and you go to these these parties. I mean, they would be incredible. These, you know, you can see. I mean, you can see the, the decor. You know, you can imagine what the women are wearing as well. Um, but it's all, you know, the men have all been thrown out of the house. It's all women, and it's strictly no cameras, um, no phones. Even you know, you have these parties, and on the invites, there's no cameras and no phones. Um, so they have this kind of very peculiar kind of, you know, divided sort of sort of. This, this, this sort of bubble that they, they feel like they can contain it all, and I found that very, um, I found it, you know, very surprising. Of course, I, I, you know, I was dying to photograph it all, but at the same time, realizing that I couldn't, and I didn't want to just go in and like secretly take pictures and and expose it. Well, it's not, I mean, it's it's not the way I, it's not the way I like to work. It's not, it's not what I wanted to do at all. But um, but but at the same time, I was really itching to be able to take some pictures to, to show what this kind of amazing world looked like. Um, so it was a sort of, I think I, at some point I wrote a, um, uh, a blog post about this hat saying that, a, a little bit tongue-in-cheek because of course it wouldn't be easier to be a man in these situations, of course you wouldn't be able to go to these situations, but, but if you go as a man in, into, <laughs> you know, in, in Saudi society, when you meet women, you, they are already, I mean, they cover themselves as much as they would want to be covered, and 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 it will vary. And some women will cover their faces, and some women will um, not, and some women will cover their hair, and some women will not, and, and so it'll vary. But then, as a man, you you kind of already you're already the outside, right? So you're already the sort of 
public world. Um, so you'd be able to photograph, and what you see is actually what you know you could show. So for me, what I could see was not what I could show. So I kind of write at some point that it maybe would be easier to be on. Um, but of course, then there would be no access to these situations. Um, this was a friend of mine um, who called herself Lighty. They all have these sort of double names that they use, um, or se several names because they use, you know, they have names that they use online for they have sort of online personalities. So she was called Lighty, and I also not lost track of like who's like what what people's real name were and what their their kind of uh, the other name was. And for example, I had there was a there was an incident with one one of my friends. We went to meet. She'd met someone online using her other name. And this this guy, and we, she was we were gonna, she was going to go on a kind of date with him, which meant you know going for coffee. But we were all going to go along too, so we were sort of <laughs> piled in the car. But we had to remember to use the other name to call her, so that he couldn't identify her, like or you know, or figure out who her family was. So that uh, and, and then at some point, her sister called her by the wrong name, and then it was all over, and we had to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre situations there. Um, and the place is sort of full of contradictions like that. That. You know, for example, when you you have this thing that you um, it's, put, it's it's written about a little bit in the media. Some of you probably heard of this, but that people um, uh, show their phone numbers or they throw their phone numbers on little bits of paper into <coughs> car windows, um, and it's this you know these incredible things. And I, I was saying to people, you know, we would never do that. That's you know not. Um, but, but this situation causes people to meet people in a really you know in a different way. I have a picture, in fact, in my it's in, it's in the book of a guy who had. So he had his phone number like on this great big plate like this, so he could hold it up in the car window so you could see it or take a picture of it. And then he saw me get his camera, my camera, and, and he has a light to so flick, flick it on and it flashed blue. So and I got a picture of it, and, and it is in the book. So, <laughs> um, but then I mean, so I, so I started doing this and I started photographing, you know, trying to kind of conceal faces and doing doing great things. But it, it was also, it still wasn't all that real. I wanted to get, you know, I really wanted to try and show people a little bit more, a little bit closer to kind of the feeling of reality there. And, and when I went back on my second trip, I went, the, the girls had an exhibition of the work that they had done. Um, and so I went back for the for the exhibition. And, and, and some of, the, I mean, just to sort of mention some of the work that they had done, they had photographed, I mean, it was, you know, they photographed, um, you know, buildings, it was quite, it was quite safe. They photographed buildings and, and Instruments, and, but one of the girls had photographed her sister. In fact, one of the most conservative girls in my class had photographed her sister, but just tiny details, so like tiny details of her praying, and, and like, but it was kind of it was very interesting of her like drinking her coffee like this. So, um, so they had an exhibition of this work, and um, and I went back and I took a little digital, like a you know little camera, little snapshot camera like this, and um, and I found I was able to take pictures, a different kind of pictures, like like this, for example, pictures in a way that they they looked at me. Differently with this camera in my hand, and it's and it's a, a kind of an interesting thing because they still knew that I was a professional photographer, and they still knew that I wanted to do something with the pictures, but they would forget when I picked up a different camera, and they would respond differently. Um, and it, it, I mean, this is this this became something that then became quite quite big for the project, and I, I I ended up so I took a lot of pictures, and they were kind of more candid, and they were a bit more open with me. And then I would show them because I've always shown them the pictures, and I've always sort of asked them, you know, wanted them wanted to have their opinion, wanted to, to see what they thought. Um, and but they were like, no, no, you can't use those pictures. You realise that because I was like, really? <laughs> so, so we sort of gone several steps back. So now I had a lot of pictures that I wanted to use, but that they didn't want me to use. So I tried to, you know, do different things and, and to kind of cover the faces and find different, you know. Approaches. Um, I spent a lot, a long time, you know, trying to, you know, of course, if you cut out the face or you you make it black or I mean, people have tried different things with it. So there's, there's very often a very heavy, a negative feeling with it, and I really didn't want that. And so I spent a lot of time trying to find something that didn't feel so negative. And um, what I've done in the end is actually print. They were printed out. I mean, these were on digital camera, so I printed them out in a little shot there, and I re photographed them with a flash that hits and, and reflects on the face. And um and and I again I wanted to show them to see you know they had been saying can't you like blur the faces or do something so I, so I went to show them and I was sort of nervous how they would respond and in fact the response was so telling because what they said um, when they saw this picture was like that's great exactly that's what we said but can't you just show a little bit more of her eye so we can see how beautiful she is <laughs> <laughs> so this is like the in between you know it was this this it, it captures so much of this kind of contradiction of their situation and and you know at some point. 
At some point, you know, you know, when I was working there, I felt very um, frustrated. I felt I sort of, you, you, I asked myself, you know, why do I want to do this? Why am I pushing to try and take pictures if these people want to be so private? Why, you know, makes you question the, you know, my, made me question my role as a photographer. But at the same time, the girls wanted us, wanted me to show. It was like, yes, show people our world, you know, show them that our life is not so bad, that we have a, you know, what we do. And so it was sort of, I was caught in between that. And this picture then became the, the front cover of the book. Um, and I, I, I always really like this one because again you have this, and I really like the, the effect that you had with this sort of splattering of the light because it wasn't defined. So you know how sort of like if you cut out the face, you remove like the whole face, and this way you you you, you stop her being identifiable, but you can still kind of see her face. So it's this in between, which is very much what I experienced there. This wasn't it wasn't very clear. It's not really very clear what where what you can see ends and then. And so this kind of, you have this sort of feeling of intimacy, but at the same time you can't actually see her eyes. So that's why this, this picture kind of came to represent the, the project for me, in that sense. It was the sort of in-between of what you can see and what you can't see. Um, so this is uh, what uh, happens to stuff that comes into the country that gets, uh, and you know, magazines and everything that comes in gets sort of blacked out like this, sort of a black market. And you have, um, these high walls again, like I was talking in the beginning, and so this is a sort of private hotel beach, and you can go in, and, and, and if you, you know, once you're in, you can go, you can, you know, you can go for a swim in a bikini. It, it's not what's what's what I think people misunderstand about Saudi Arabia is that actually there are so many places where there aren't rules. Once you're sort of out of public, you can go into these. I mean, this is still very public in a way. It's a hotel. You can walk in and 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 uh, go and swim there. So it's this. There's a lot of contradiction again in this this idea of like where the rules are applied and, and what the sets of rules are. And I found, you know, I mean, I constantly found it confusing, you know, more and more confusing. And this is taken in a place called Dura Salarus, which is um, which is like a, a beach town just outside Jeddah. So all all of this work is is made in Jeddah. Um, I mean, this is just outside Jeddah. So on the weekends, a lot of people go to this this beach town, which is it's quite big. There's a sort of marina there, you know. Stretches of villas, hotels, and there's a sort of gate. It's, it's privately owned, and there's a sort of gate you go through at the beginning. And when you're in, there are the rules that you're used to are not there. So you can wear what you want for swimming. Women can drive cars, ride bikes. So you have this kind of other sets of rules, and, and you know you can imagine for me, I'm like shaking my head. I don't get it. It just becomes more confusing. Um, and then of course some people. So it's you know mostly for the most part people just are very conservative, and that's. You know, of course there are, of course there are the uh, the matara, the, the religious police who will enforce in public areas the way you're dressed and, and some things. But for the most part, it kind of comes from people, their you know their families, the community. That that's the most important thing. And here you see sort of different varieties of what people choose to wear and riding bikes in, in the same place. And um, when I went back actually on my last trip, um, I met that girl, um, Lighty, that, I, that you saw the picture of in the tent, and she was a bit of a wild child, and she showed me, again, another side to life there, which was the, the party scene. Um, and this is, I mean, this picture is taken, and you can't see the scale of this place in this picture, um, but it's like a warehouse party, I mean, like a big warehouse party, like I would, you know, you would go to in East London with all the same things happening that you would expect in any warehouse party in anywhere else. And that, I, I literally must have, my jaw must have dropped when I went into this place because it was so like another world. But it's on a compound, so again, in the compound the rules are different. But, but of course, taking pictures in here is very, very controversial. Um, and this is in a sort of um, uh, private house party. And again, sort of parties hanging out in compounds. This, so this, again, this was like another world again. And I, I, the way I started to see it was that you had all these different worlds, and people sometimes crossed from different, from these different worlds, these different bubbles, you know, between them. But, it, but, you know, you tried to understand that, like, okay, these people are like this, and these people are like this, or this, you know, this is one set of rules, and this is another set of rules. But actually, became increasingly uh, complicated and, and unclear. So. Um, it took me a very long time to put this together into a book, so I finished in 2010 and, and I published a book in 2012. 
Um, and I think mainly because of this, because I, I didn't totally, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to put it, I didn't know how to lay it out, I found it very, I didn't totally understand it, I didn't understand, I, didn't, I couldn't say, okay, this is what it's like there. And um, I had started doing, I had started writing down these, these things, I mean, as, as I mentioned, there were so many times that I couldn't photograph, so many occasions, um, and so I started writing them down as little anecdotes, and um, Initially, I had wanted to put it as, as a sort of introduction, you know, a whole lot of, you know, all these things that I could have photographed. And, um, but as I was working on the book, I kind of, I realized they, they were actually more important than that. This wasn't the introduction. These were actually the missing pictures in a way. So I, when I put it together, I, I wanted to give these, these little anecdotes, these little sort of missing pieces. Um, as much weight as the photographs, and when I put them in the book, they, they sit there in the same place as the photographs, and they have the same weight. And that was that was very important to me when I made the book. And I think that putting that putting I mean putting putting it in the first person, putting putting these anecdotes in that sort of fill in the missing pieces, but also took people on my journey and kind of ha maybe showed a little bit my confusion of, of trying to understand this place and the kind of ups and downs, the different points of view. And, and so I wanted people, rather than to say, okay, this is what Saudi Arabia is like, I wanted people to say, to see, this is, this is the experience that I had. These are the people and these are the experiences that I met. And sort of come on this journey with me and, and, and you can make up your own mind. So these are all sort of integrated with the pictures throughout the book. And so I call it Jed's Diary. Um, again, I wanted it to be very much about my, my my diary, my experience, my kind of journey, and not necessarily an answer to the puzzle of what life is like in Saudi Arabia, but one 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 experience of it. So I'm, I'm probably overrunning, so I'm going to have to go quickly to Dubai. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's exactly right now. Maybe I'm just ahead of this. <laughs> um, so. Um, one thing leads on to another, and because of the Saudi book, I was invited to Dubai for an artist residency, um, 2013. Um, so, so I was invited to Dubai, and everybody said to me, so you're going to do more stories about women? Um, and I said, no, I don't, I, <laughs> I'm not. Um, I, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time working on it, and I, I, I want to do something else. Um, and, and, I mean, even beyond that, I think, importantly, I, I think uh, the story in Dubai is actually not about women. I think um, uh, Dubai, I mean, the proportion, I mean, the number of women, percentage of women in Dubai is actually about 30%, I think. Um, it's a very male city, um, and the story there is really, um, it, it's about, I mean, it's, it's, there are so many stories, there's so much kind of strangeness about the city, um, and I wanted to experience, I wanted to find a different way to I, I wanted to, I mean, it was, an, it was an artist residency, and it was like this defined amount of time, I was there for three months, and I wanted to uh, challenge myself to do something a little bit different, um, and so I started looking, I started, I mean, I started researching as well, I mean, that's for me always very important, I, I go to someone that I don't know, I start doing a lot of research, and I, I, I knew that I wanted to look at the history of Dubai, because I felt that people don't talk about the history um, enough. People are always looking at the future and what it's becoming and what it's going to be and um, never really looking back. Um, and I also knew that I wanted to talk about the Indian, the older Indian community um, that that live in Dubai, that people think of Indians in, in Dubai and they think of the workers, but actually there's a much older, richer um, uh, Indian business community that are, that are kind of very important in Dubai and have been very important and, and they're kind of people who've actually built up the city into what it is today and of course there's the of course along with the Sheikh and, and, and you know and the, the Emiratis. I mean all the Emirat the, the Emiratis who are about nine percent of the population. But um, so there so I wanted to look at that community and I started researching and I, I came across this story of a shipwreck <coughs> on this boat, the N V Dara, um, that sank just outside the port of Dubai in nineteen sixty one. Um, and it was a boat that, that used to travel, the British boat actually, that used to travel between um, India and Pakistan and the Gulf. Um, and, um, and and I started reading stories about it and, and I found it really interesting. People had mostly not heard of it. 
But I started looking, you know, digging things up a little bit, and I found some newspaper articles and and stories. And then I, and I came across the story of a um, a family who'd been looking for their son, who believed that their son um, had survived somehow, um, and they to this day still look for him, and believe that he's he's alive somewhere. So I kind of decided to take this as my starting point. Um, and the idea was what not not this man, not this specific family, but just what like what if someone could have survived this, this so these are people being rescued actually from the from the shipwreck itself but what if someone could have survived 50 years somewhere on an island in the gulf and we'll come to the city now how would they see it and i wanted to see it with those eyes rather than the eyes you know D- dubai is a very cliquey city everybody's very divided by nationality and i didn't want to just see the kind of white expat community i wanted to explore the city um, and I want to take this point of view of someone kind of arriving and seeing it and and being, I suppose, thrown by it in the way that I also was when I first arrived. Um, this very strange city, this the kind of the way that it's been built. I mean, I, I my my first um, my first incentive to was to, was to walk to explore the city and see see how it looked. And um, it's again not a city that you can explore on foot. I. Um, um, you don't have to have a car. I mean, what's, one of the strange things that I discovered in Dubai, which um, I think comes in, this is, so this is the part. My, well, my first experience actually was like, um, bizarrely, so for a very sort of Dubai star artist residency, I was actually staying on the palm. Um, and so my first experience, I wanted to walk, but I, and I found that like, you can't actually walk off the palm because the only thing that's connected to the mainland is a sort of highway. So you have to kind of scramble and climb over onto the highway and walk off that. So I hide a car. Um, but basically, um, what, is, what is particularly strange about the city is you have this old creek where the boats are, and then you have this new marina that they've, they've built up, and in between you have this uh, stretch of road, which is basically a sort of ten-lane highway. And, and, and essentially I realised that actually this ten-lane highway is kind of the core of the city, mm. So, which is perhaps what makes it such a strange city. So, so you know, this, I mean, it really is a huge... And it's long as well, it takes sort of nearly half an hour to drive that length. And that, the city is built around that. And then there's this desire to build skyscrapers. So they've sort of built these skyscrapers. So they've got this 10 lane highway and then they've built skyscrapers alongside of it. Um, but you know, you, you build skyscrapers because you need the space, right? But the, behind the skyscrapers, there's just sand. So you have this very surreal, so you get these sandstorms that come up and kind of blow through a very surreal feeling place. Um, I'm going to go through a little quickly now because I'm running on. Um, and uh, so yes, I explored. I saw all the kind of. I tried to see it with the eyes of someone who would think, "What is this bizarre place? And what is going on here?" And I tried to connect it a little bit with the history. There's the old creek, the old fort. And I tried to meet people who knew that period, um, that time before. I was talking about the 1960s. This is someone from the old, that old Indian community. And I, and I made interviews, and I recorded what people said, li- uh, literally recorded them, so that I was able, with these te- with these quotes, to, to write them down exactly as they were, <coughs> as they were said. So I made interviews with people from that older community about, and, and Indian community, but, but different, you know. There were also some, I think I met some Western expats who'd been there as well for that long. Um, and also people who've come there now, and what people felt about their experiences they're coming there now. I mean, it's a very, it's still very much a city that people come to that, that they come and they, they look for something, they 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 have a, they want to come for say five years, they want to save enough money to build a house or to send their kids to school or something like that. There's still very much this feeling of, of this promise of something, promise of of money that they can make in, in Dubai. So this was on the on the palm there was this great area where they were building, you know, some they were building some new great complex that had been halted and, and, and then these, these are sort of hoardings had faded in the sun and all you had were these black shapes left. And it was a sort of picture of this ideal Dubai that faded in so I, I ended up photographing these and using them as well. And um, and I wanted to include all different types because I mean Dubai really is full of all different types of, every, you know, everybody coming and going, everybody looking for something, everybody somehow, everybody's story somehow connected to to money a little bit. And hard work. Again, coming and going, packing up. And 
I'm flicking through a little fast now because I'm going to show you a video with a lot of these pictures in it after. But I really, I mean, the, uh, as I meant before, I wrote these down as people said them. I really, I, I love these quotes. I think that the way people, I mean, recording and actually writing them down exactly as people have said them, they, they, they become very poetic in a way that someone, you know, people thought that I'd written them, but I have I couldn't write them like this. They're too, they're, they're, they sort of say things in a very beautiful way when they talked about their experiences there. This was another one of these, these, um, hoardings that have faded and it was a sort of amazing thing that I would always see as I drove back down the path this and, and, and the way they had organised it was that you would start because you you drive this way on the road and, and so you would start it was sort of this like apocalyptic sort of just destruction of the palm that you drive past every day to drive onto the palm. It's a bizarre imagery that they have up. And and I photographed a lot in this old area around the Creek, which is where the city grew up from, and essentially a sort of fishing village and trading port. Um, in the one part that kind of remains a little, that keeps a little bit of its history. This was a um, singing competition in, in the Labour camps, which was um, sponsored by Western Union, so obviously the most important uh, thing in, in the Labour. Full of these, these. I mean, now a lot, a lot of uh, building, a lot of this construction that was sort of halted, and that's at that time um, has kind of moved forwards because they're going to have the expo. So I, I was back there, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, and, and parts of the city are completely unrecognisable because they've sliced it up to make new islands and new things for the for the expo. This is one of the rare pictures I have in in, in, in the work, which is of the um, Emiratis themselves. Um, I mean, you really don't come into contact with the Emiratis very much at all. Um, they keep they're very they keep out of society a lot. They kind of they're very elusive. Um, but I, I sort of encountered them in the middle of the night in the desert with this, you know, their car racing. And this is uh, yeah, so the book cleaning the fountain at the bottom of the Burj Khalifa. And this one there, swimming in the sea on on Diwali. So um, right at the end of the trip, um, to kind of like wrap it all together, I um, I learned to dive and I dived the shipwreck. So of course, you know, going, you know, I was exploring the city, I was hearing people's stories, but it was always coming back to the story of the shipwreck and what happened and people, you know, people's memory of it. And um, and it's still down there, 20 meters um, under off, off, a little bit north of you by now. So I went down and I, I photographed the shipwreck and it was quite an amazing experience after all this time, kind of hearing all the stories and 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 in a way this kind of brought it all together for me. Um, and I want to just mention very briefly um, here that I, so, so when I put the book together, so I was working on the book and I really wanted these quotes to sort of sit with the images. And that, it's always been very important for me for the, that the text should have kind of an equal weighting to the, to the images. And I want them to sit together, but I don't want them to be captioned. And I, and I struggle with that. I struggle with finding the right way for that. And so I had made a little book dummy with the text on transparent paper and, and in between the images so that you could see them, so you could see the image and the text at the same time. And, and we were playing around and I was working with the designer and, and, and I came up with this idea, like, what, what if we printed the whole book on transparent paper? Um, and it's quite a controversial thing to do, of course. I mean, at, at the sacrifice of the individual picture, you get this very different experience with the book. You see the picture backwards on the other side, you see the layers of picture together, you see the text <coughs> and things on top of each other, and it becomes it becomes quite sort of claustrophobic, but then chaotic. But it, it, it for me that really gave the, the feeling of the experience of Dubai and and being a bit lost and not it not quite making sense. And, and so I um you know I went to went to quite a lot of long lengths to be able to print this book on transparent paper. Um, I mean, it just, I just, it does, you, you, you can't. I have some copies of the book outside, which you can have a look at. Um, it's very difficult to see until you kind of actually pick up the book and see the paper itself. Um, and to end, so there's the book. Um, to end, I'm going to show you. So when we launched the book, um, so it's actually published by Fishbar, which is my uh, publishing house, and we um, uh, we have a little space in London. And but rather than having an exhibition, I wanted to do something different and. Um, I had also collected sounds from Dubai, um, uh, recorded sounds, and um, so I, I commissioned, um, in fact my brother, he's a musician, um, him and, and, uh, and a guy he works with, they put these sounds together into a, like an, an audio piece and we made a, a video installation in, in the space for the book launch. So I'm just going to end with that.